I think the summary that hepatitis B is a lifelong dynamic disease that changes over time, unlike hepatitis C, which progresses over time. And the risk of end-stage liver disease and cancer increases with ongoing inflammation and viremia. Another important point is cirrhosis can be reversible. The drugs decrease fibrosis depress, uh, progression and even can reverse cirrhosis. Hepatitis B can be controlled, but it cannot be cured. And reactivation occurs even those who have lost surface antigen. So you need, they're the sort of take home points so you can leave now. Um, when we think about how many patients there are, Jürgen has told you that this is really half. The Chinese have actually looked at hepatitis B and it is decreasing. It's a, considered to be 4%, not 7 or 8%. Whether this is 280, less or more is not clear. HIV doesn't seem to have changed in the last few years. Co-infection with B and C, there are considered to be about 15 million worldwide and a much smaller percent with the trifecta. There's geographic distribution, as you know. There are countries which are the melting pot, the US, Alaska. There are countries uh, in the Far East and China, B and C is the most common in the Mediterranean, A and D. We don't have huge amounts of data on the effect of genotype. We know that, oops, this one. We know that AA has a much higher incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma in the young. We know that C has more progressive disease and perhaps a higher incidence of cancer. We know that D is the antigen negative disease. We think about the virus. You only have to remember that the Dane particle surface antigen is the envelope. And inside the core antigen plus the partially double-stranded DNA. But surface antigen and E antigen are also produced as subviral particles from an alternative transcription in the liver. So you need to know that E antigen is not envelope, it is an extra subviral particle and is not part of the infectious virion. Here's the infectious virion with the envelope that comes in small, medium, and large. Inside the core protein with the polymerase where all of our um, uh, drugs now target and the partially double-stranded DNA virus. So when we think of serology, surface antigen is seen in acute or chronic infection. It's the first marker, serologic marker to appear, and it's chronic if you have surface antigen for more than six months. E antigen indicates active replication of the virus. It's absent if the patient has inactive disease, but it's absent if the patient has mutations in E antigen. Total antibody to core, known as anti-core, is present as IgM in acute infection. It's present in past exposure and may occur alone when surface antibody wanes. And also in HIV, where you have atypical serologies. Antibody to surface, top right, is seen with so-called recovery, which is really latency from hepatitis B. You see it alone after vaccination. It's occasionally seen in chronic carriers who or have surface antigen. So if you have a patient with surface antigen who also have surface antibody, it's not a neutralizing antibody, they still have chronic infection. And antibody to E generally indicates that the virus is no longer replicating, but as I told you, it's present in those who have mutations to the E antigen. So patients who have genotype D have anti-E active disease. What do you do with the results? Surface antigen positive, you've got to take care of the patient. If they're surface and core antibody positive, that's past infection, which is really latency, and I have a slide on that in a minute. 
If they have no markers, they need to be vaccinated. And if they only have antibody to surface, they have been vaccinated. Congratulations. So how, what sort of control can you have of the disease? You can have inflammatory control where you normalize the ALT and you have a normal liver biopsy, if you are silly enough to do one. You can have virologic control, which is decrease in HPV DNA, or you can have immunologic control. That is seroconversion from E antigen to E antibody or from surface antigen to surface antibody but we cannot as yet cure it, but we're working on it. So who do you treat? You treat those who have inflammation and fibrosis, those who have hepatitis, that is elevated ALT, elevated HPV DNA. And if it's not clear whether they have chronic hepatitis, then you need to do a biopsy, which you need to do not very often. The EASL guidelines has made it simple. These came out uh, last year, and it differentiates chronic infection from chronic hepatitis. You can see both have surface antigen and E antigen in E antigen positive disease. And the distinction is in the HPV DNA, which is highest in chronic infection and less high in chronic hepatitis. In ALT, and liver disease, normal ALT without any liver disease in chronic infection, and chronic hepatitis, they're both elevated or moderate or severe. So you only treat those with chronic hepatitis, and these are the old names at the bottom. In E antigen negative disease, again, surface antigen is positive in both, E antigen is negative in both, and the distinction is in HPV DNA, ALT, and liver disease. So in chronic infection, the old carry, uh, inactive state, you have a low DNA, a normal ALT, and no liver disease. Whereas in chronic hepatitis, you have an elevated DNA, an elevated ALT, and moderate or severe disease. Makes it very nice and simple. So how do you monitor patients? You monitor them with, if the patient comes to you first and you don't know if they have chronic infection or chronic hepatitis, then what you do is monitor the ALT and HPV DNA every three months for a year. If both remain normal, that person has does not have chronic hepatitis, and they can go to every six months. If it's abnormal, then you need to treat them. Remember, normal ALT is 19 for women and 30 for men, not what they tell you in your lab. Older patients may have cirrhosis with normal ALT. If the HPV DNA is low, you monitor. And if it's elevated, you need to consider whether the patient needs therapy. If the patient is older or with a family history, you need to monitor them for a paracellular carcinoma. So who do you treat? Chronic hepatitis, simple. Elevated ALT, HPV DNA. Cirrhotics, you treat all cirrhotics if they have detectable HPV DNA. You don't follow guidelines, just treat them. If they have hepatocellular carcinoma, treat them. There is data to show that it prolongs life. If they have HIV, treat them. If they're on chemotherapy or biologic response modifiers, treat them. And in pregnancy, if HPV DNA is higher than 200,000 international units, treat them in the third trimester to prevent mother-to-child transmission. These are the approved treatments, and it's really sad, nothing much has happened. In 10 years, we just got a cousin of tenofovir, and that's it. But we're working on it. How good are these um, polymerase inhibitors that we have at the moment? Well, this is data on entecavir, but you, I could have shown a slide on tenofovir showing that either at week 48 in red or week uh, three years in green, 
Treatment, long-term treatment gives histologic improvement and fibrosis improvement. Remember I told you, you can reverse fibrosis with nukes. You also get undetectable HPV DNA, whether you look at intecavir in red, tenofovir in green, and interferon. With the nucleosides, you get marked imp uh, undetectable HPV DNA over years. With interferon, you get low but not undetectable. But what about surface antigen? That's really what you want to get rid of. And you can see that it's pretty lousy. We don't have great cures with surface antigen. We can control the virus, we can make HPV DNA undetectable, but we can't eradicate. There is some data from last year showing that if you have tenofovir plus interferon, they reported a 10% uh, loss of surface antigen, but I caution you that over a third of the patients were genotype A, and they respond the best, so it probably isn't fair to generalize it to other genotypes. This is in E antigen positive patients. E antigen negative patients, it's even worse. Even when you had uh, combination therapy. So interferon is really the only drug that leads to surface antigen loss in the antigen negative patients. So when we talk about cure, we can talk about a functional cure, which is what you get after acute infection, sustained off drug, no inflammation, normal ALT, normal liver biopsy, loss of surface antigen and acquisition of surface antibody. Or a complete cure or a virologic cure would be all of that plus loss of CCC DNA in the liver. And I think we have to think about this development of inactive state or chronic infection rather than hepatitis, which is loss of inflammation, normal liver biopsy, low or undetectable DNA, even those who are surface antigen positive. We can do this at the moment with nukes and with interferon. So I just show you this not to wander through the virologic life cycle, but to show you what happens when you're cured. So here's a partially double-stranded DNA virion, comes into the liver, gets uncoated, comes to the nucleus where it's in, made into covalently closed circular DNA. So it's repaired, and this is the template for transcription. You make more virus, here's where the nukes work, and when you make more virus, either goes back into the nucleus to augment CCC DNA or out to infect another cell. What happens when you're cured? You have no virus in the blood. You have no viral replication in the cytoplasm. So the body says, the immune system, surface antigen is negative. We have antibody to surface, antibody to core. You call this recovered and that's what the textbook says, or cured, but it's really latent because you still have CCC DNA in the liver. And that, as the template for um, viral replication, can be reactivated. Probably the best way to do it is with transplantation or with rituximab. So patients on immunosuppressive therapy have a high rate of reactivation during chemotherapy in HIV patients, organ transplantation, or with biologic response modifiers. Rituximab is the best. TNF is also okay, but not as efficient. So all patients who just have anti-core should be prophylaxed with rituximab. And all patients prior to chemotherapy need all three tested. If they have surface antigen, they must be on treatment. If they have antibody to core, they should be on treatment. If they're going on rituximab, if they're going on other biologics, they should be monitored closely. You need to test if they need antiviral therapy and consider, oh, I already said that, okay. Hepatocellular carcinoma and hepatitis B. There's an increased risk of progression in those who are male 
who have younger age of infection, who have comorbidities such as alcohol and fatty liver, who have high HBV DNA levels, who have co-infections with HIV, hepatitis C or D, and genotypes C and AA, it's higher. You screen them monthly, six monthly, with ultrasound and alpha feta protein. Ultrasound is excellent at finding a lesion. It's not excellent at saying what the lesion is. So you follow it up with a CT. And the CT, you use a quad phase a trip or triple phase CT. So you see here at the early phase with hepatic artery, you can see the lesion at the later phase, which is the portal vein, remember two thirds of the blood supply to the liver is portal vein. Cancers are almost always supplied by the hepatic artery. In the portal vein phase, you see washout. That's pathognomonic of hepatocellular carcinoma. If you look at baseline HBV DNA, this is old revealed data showing you that the risk of cancer is markedly increased with the level of HBV DNA. The higher the DNA, the higher the risk of cancer. That is why we're trying to drive down the virus to decrease cancer and cirrhosis. If you look in co-infected, survival, really this confusing data with HIV and hepatocellular carcinoma, with some studies showing an worse survival and some not, probably because we're not doing a very good job of monitoring our patients with co-infection of HIV and HBV. And this study from LIM, where they had only a small number of patients who were monitored closely and all their images reviewed at tumor board, showed no significant difference. But all studies show that hepatocellular carcinoma occurred at a younger age, but other factors weren't necessarily common. So co-infection, HIV increases the rate of HBV chronicity after acute infection. It's less than 5% in adults. It's 20 to 22% in those with HIV. HBV DNA is higher. Those with HIV with HBV have higher antiretroviral hepatotoxicity. Those who are co-infected have increased end-stage liver disease. And lovely studies have shown that they have poor in-hospital outcomes, more progression to cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma than even than HIV alone or HBV alone. In co-infection, the immune response predicts the hepatitis B outcome. Flares are common because of hepatotoxicity, but you also have to look for other causes of elevated ALT. And pretty uncommon now is stopping therapy, which is a disaster in co-infected patients. Atypical serologies can occur, so you can have mutations in surface antigen, and your co-infected patient may be surface antigen negative, anti-core positive, and have active disease. You need to look for that, and all patients require screening for hepatocellular carcinoma. One slide on pregnancy, check in the mono-infected, because in the co-infected, they'll already be on treatment. In the mono-infected, check HBV DNA at 26 to 28 weeks. If it's less than 20,000, no treatment. If it's between 20 and 200,000, consider if the mother needs treatment. Often, these are young women who don't want to start treatment until after their childbearing age, but if they have significant fibrosis or cirrhosis, they must be on treatment for themselves. But if it's greater than 200,000, you're going to give antiviral therapy in the last trimester to prevent mother-to-child transmission. And that antiviral therapy has to be tenofovir and tecovir. There's uh, increased uh, toxicity in animals, so we don't use it. At telbivudine and lamivudine are OK, but there's a risk of resistance. So in summary, Treat a hepatitis B patient if it's elevated ALT and elevated HBV DNA and those other special considerations I told you. 
Remember comorbidities occur, check HIV, Hep C, Hepatitis D, and check for Hepatitis A, as Dr. Rockstra told you, that you, can, you should vaccinate all patients who are negative for Hepatitis A, check metabolic syndrome, I didn't have enough time to talk about that, occurs about 20% of patients with Hep B, less than with Hep C, which is about 50% and less than the general population, which is about 30%. You need to tell your hepatitis B patients they should report to their primary care provider any new whether there's any new diagnosis or planned therapy. I tell my patients, remember you have hepatitis B. If you develop cancer or you're going to be put on a biologic, you need to be on therapy. If they're receiving high-dose steroids, chemotherapy or rituximab, if they're pregnant or wish to become pregnant, the time to tell them is the first time to, you see them and every time thereafter. Remember screening with six monthly imaging and alpha feeder protein. And lastly, I just want to finish with the new strategies to eradicate hepatitis B. This is really exciting and is a talk all of its own. But now we have virologic approaches coming to the clinic, entry inhibitors, CCC DNA inhibitors are only in the lab, transcription inhibitors, RNA interference, capsid inhibitors, and secretion inhibitors are all being studied, and polymerase inhibitors we already have. But there are also host immune approaches, interferons you know about, TLR7, the study didn't work, PD-1, PDL one is ongoing, IL-7 seems to be stopped, and therapeutic vaccines have not yet been of any value. And this is a summary slide from a presentation from Stephen Locanini and myself in Gastro and Help, HEP, showing you that there are entry inhibitors, there are nuclear transport inhibitors, there are transcription inhibitors, there are encapsidation inhibitors, there are an assembly and secretion inhibitors. And this is to sh remind you that CCC DNA, you get transcription of core and pregenomic RNA, which goes to the whole virion, but you also get translation of the subviral particles that come out independently. And any one of these steps can be inhibited. Studies are ongoing looking at uh, in humans, and I think we will get cures for hepatitis B before we get them for HIV because we're that much further ahead. Thank you very much.